the crocodile's mouth. The crocodile says, I'm hungry. Or Clover says, I won't clean your teeth anymore, and the crocodile's teeth all fall out. In a way, you and I are called, whether you're a crocodile or a plover, we are called to be that way with each other. That each of us has some gift to offer, some ability, some skill, and it helps other people. Okay? Just like when we do and you carry bags, well, that's part of your gift. And in return, we also let people help us use their gifts and skills. And so we are asked as Christians to treat one another with love and to help one another. because that's who we are. Let's pray. God, teach us more and more that we can help and be helped and it isn't a loss that living your way is in fact a gain. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand up and say help the people around you wave at the nice folks on on facebook thank you so oh, much oh, i am sorry. good this is this is what see it is good to see you yeah, that, that's Pat this is Pastor Stephen. This is my friend Janet. Oh, hi, Janet. I'm glad to meet you. As we return to our seats, as as we return to our seats, So when, um, when I say each Sunday multiple times, uh, see, I, see, I think it's great that I have to do that because I like watching y'all love up on each other. But, you know, about the third time I go, let us return to our seats, I'm reminded of the pastor who was preaching one Sunday and he was talking about the second coming. And the first time he said, Behold, I come quickly. I sort of looked at him. He said, I, I, this didn't, you know. Behold, I come quickly. And the congregation just looked at him. And he finally said, Behold, I come quickly. And he knocked over the pulpit and he landed in the lap of a deacon on the front row. And as he was getting up, he said, Deacon Jones, I am so sorry. Deacon Jones looked at him and said, it's my own fault, Reverend. 
you warned me three times. Anyway, so every time, if you see me start to laugh when I go, as we return to our seats, you will know that I'm thinking of what it would be like if I launched myself outward into the, anyway. I'm going to ask that Joyce come now and pray over our offering. Father God, thank you for gathering us together today in your house. Thank you, Lord, for the tithes and offerings that are given back to your church to further your kingdom, to help others, and to help our church grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Sacred witness bear in this glad out
that this is one of the more powerful themes within these passages. And I'm going to maintain that if we are going to follow Jesus, we are going to hear this ourselves. So we're going to read now from Matthew 8, 28 through 9, 8. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gerasenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted, have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. And the demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, go. So they came out and they went into the pigs and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off and went into town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. They went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. And some men brought him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. And when Jesus saw the faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. And at this point, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is it easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or take up your bed and walk? But so that you but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. But the man got up and went. And when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to man. People begin to find in his actions things that they weren't sure they liked. That or as we would have said down home, don't bring that stuff in here. There they are. They have just heard the news that Jesus had healed two demoniacs and that the herd of pigs had gone into the sea. Now, there's some interesting things going on here. Um, the demons recognize Jesus, and they say, you're early. It isn't time to torment us. And, and then the demons, um, this may not have been the brightest group of demons. But they said, let us go into the herd of pig. Now, they've been tormenting these two men for years. I think, okay, we'll go torment the herd of pigs. What they don't realize is that pig don't have the strength that people have against torment. So the pigs go, oh, and they rush down the, 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 the bank into the water. Now, a little aside here that may be helpful is one of the reasons why I don't think these demons were terribly bright, the sea, the water that they jumped into, was thought by 
people in Jesus' day to contain the abyss, the place where the demons would be sent when all was said and done. And so these demons simply put their winding up in the abyss in overdrive. Because Jesus said, sure, go into the biggest. And they did, and they did. And everybody came out and said, please. He, he had upset their economy. These people raised pigs for a living, herds of them. Now, the Jews on the other side of the lake wouldn't eat pig, wouldn't eat pork. These people, these Gentiles, they ate pork, and their economy depended on it, which is why they said, please go away from here. If you're going to do this, do it somewhere else that doesn't mess with our economy. So he left. He got in the boat and he went back over. And as he was getting off the boat, some folks brought the paralyzed man to him. And this is one of those stories that at least two of the Gospels contain, and I've always loved it. Because if I'm paralyzed, and lying on a mat, Ray, you're Jesus. Okay, all right. I want to get to see Jesus. How am I going to get there? Somebody, anybody. You get carried. You get carried. Four of this man's friends loved him enough to pick him up and to carry him to where Jesus was. In, in one account, they tore the roof off the building to, to get him, you know, in front of Jesus because the, 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 the house was too full. And they went upstairs. Most of these houses had flat roofs and set of stairs, and you went up and you did your laundry and you bathed and whatever. So they took him up the steps. Have you ever tried to carry dead weight up steps? Okay, think about four people carrying this fella up these steps. Okay, I used to haul drywall. Um, and it, it, at least one person here knows what I'm talking about about this. Dale, pumping drywall up steps is just a pain. And this is what I think about when I think about these four people carrying their friend. And they bring him to Jesus. And Jesus says, your, son, your sins are forgiven. And there are always people who believe that um, whatever you're doing isn't okay. But this had to do with power. The Pharisees were part of a power structure. And there was a normal way, if you want to get healed, you get healed. How do you do it? You go to the temple. You offer the sacrifices. If you want your sins forgiven, you go to the temple. You offer your sacrifices. And here is this man. He's not acting for a sacrifice. He just says, your sins are forgiven. And so they're upset because he hasn't done it the right way. And he says to them, is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or to say, take up your bed and go home? Take up your bed and go home. And the man gets up, he rolls up his little mat, and he goes home. It seems to me 
that many people were fine with Jesus until he upset their apple cart. You see, the things that Jesus taught broke the power economy and challenged the economy. And if Jesus was going to be there and do that, if Jesus is going to be king over our world, something's got to give. Something's got to give. Jesus challenges our insistence that this is a zero-sum game. Uh, a game is like this. I've got this piece of candy. I think this one came from Brenda. Um, if I give you this piece of candy, do I have any candy left? I do. You do. Yes, you do. I don't. That's what we mean by a zero-sum game. The idea that if I give to you, there is less for me. And Jesus says, first of all, it's not a zero-sum game. As long as you have what you need, Hoarding things to yourself isn't what God wants. When I think that it's a zero-sum game, I'm thinking that if I, I, I give to you or help you, there's nothing left for me. When we get clear, when we get to the place that we understand that the kingdom of God is not a zero-sum game. And we start living that way. People going to get upset. There, there are people who cannot stand to have their apple cart turned over. They've been doing things this way for 150 years. They're not sure why anymore, but they don't want that to be challenged. Many of you have heard this story uh, about the lady who was fixing a um, a pot roast. If you've heard it, you can just smile and listen again. But before she put it in the pan, she cut off the ends of the roast. And her daughter who was watching her cook said, Mama, why, why did you do that? That's always the way my mother made pot roast. I'll ask her. So she goes to her mother and she says, Mom, why, why do we always cut off the ends of the pot roast? You know, I don't know. Your grandmother's still alive. Why don't you go ask her? So she goes to her grandmother, little one's great grandmother, and she says, how come we cut off the ends of this pot roast? And she says, oh, you know, when your grandfather and I started out, we didn't have too many cooking utensils, and I only had one pan, and it was so short that the only way to get the pot roast to fit in was to cut off the ends. How could the stuff that we do, we're not even sure why we do it. We just know they always cut off the ends of the pot roast before. But when we are listening 
to the kingdom, then we start asking, okay, why are we doing this? How does it serve the kingdom to cut off the ends of the pot roast? Well, in grandma's time, it served the kingdom because you couldn't feed your family raw pot roast and you had to cook it, and so that's what you did. But today, it simply means there is food going to waste because you've got a bigger pan. But it can also be very important and meaningful to make sure that you are living in the kingdom economy. On July the 28th in 2018, the Senate was about to repeal the Affordable Care Act. The Senate was tied. They, 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 they knew that if the vote went to the Vice President Pence, that the the final breaking tie vote would be to do away with the Affordable Care Act. There are some things wrong with the Affordable Care Act. Everybody in that Senate would have admitted that. Many of them did, and what they said was, we don't want to gut the entire thing. We can find ways to fix this. But if Trump and Pence and the Republicans had had their way, the Affordable Care Act with the things that were reasonable and decent that it had done would be gone. And on that day, John McCain had someone roll him in to the Senate floor. You remember it? And McCain went and saved those parts of the Affordable Care Act, which is still trying to fix some of the others. But he saw a different economy, an economy that wasn't gut and destroy. And in fact, that's what he said when people ask him, how, did, how, how could you vote this way? He said, there are all kinds of things wrong with this act. But none of this repeal did anything to fix those. And there are things in there we need. That's, that's a pretty subtle thing to be able to see. But seeing the, through the eyes of the kingdom and looking for a kingdom economy, and I use that term as loosely as you want to use it, not just taxes and money, but power and all of these things, puts us on the line. We have to put ourselves on the line to change things. And they're going to be people who will say, if you're going to do that sort of thing, go do it somewhere else. I think that in that one moment, I considered John Cain, who was a man I respected and didn't always agree with. I'm sure that broke him up. Um, I, I didn't know him, and so he didn't know me, so he wouldn't have cared. But I saw a heroic move in McCain's willingness to stand for what he wanted to see happen. And there are a lot of people at that point who turned their backs on John McCain. There are a lot of people who in those moments when Jesus said something that they didn't buy, turned their backs on Jesus. And finally, it cost him his life. 
And in that costing, he also saved us. But don't forget that if we are going to follow the way, there are going to be people who want us to go do it somewhere else. Clarence Jordan was a Baptist preacher back in the 50s. And he started a place called Cornania Farms. And Cornania Farms in America's Georgia, that's starting to ring bells because Jimmy Carter went to the same church that, Jer that Clarence Jordan did. But uh, Jordan um, created this um, farm and they made peanut brittle and they boiled peanuts. And one of the things that was interesting is there were no boundaries racially between the people who came to that Christian commune. And there were a lot of people saying to Clarence Jordan, go, go, go do this somewhere else. I want you to watch. Clarence Jordan is here in history. In America's Georgia, where Jimmy Carter worshiped. Jimmy Carter, till the day he was unable to do so, was still building houses for habitat for humanity. The fact that Clarence Jordan, Jordan, however you choose to pronounce it, did what he did, left a mark on Jimmy Carter so that you saw Jimmy Carter trying to live in a different economy, one that helps find housing for everyone. I, I want to tell you one more Clarence Jordan story. Um, Clarence was known, he, he translated the Gospels um, from the Greek into what was known as the cotton patch version of the Gospels. Um, and he was, would travel around and speak. He was in a church, um, and the pastor was showing him around, you know, uh, if I have a friend who comes here, I say, you want to see our building? Because we, you know, we're usually proud of our buildings. Pastors are always, you know, let me tell you about my new steeple, uh, which in fact was what happened with this pastor. They were out walking around, and he said, Brother Clarence, that cross on our steeple, cost us $500, which in that day was a big deal. And Clarence Jordan looked at him and said, hmm, there was a time when Christians could get those for free. If we are going to live in a kingdom economy, not only are we going to be, need to be willing to hear people saying, take that somewhere else. Don't bring it in here. Don't, don't bring me this stuff about acceptance or giving or any of these things that mark the kingdom. And Jesus' response to what we're going to experience is a little harsh. He doesn't say, don't worry, nobody's going to ever bother you. He says, anyone who would come after me, you need to take up your cross. Now remember, in Jesus' day, that was like me saying, tie a hangman's noose around your neck and carry the rope with you. We take up our cross daily to try to live in the kingdom. And I read these two stories and I think, 
Well, if it was good enough for Jesus, maybe it needs to be good enough for me to hear that kind of conflict. In any case, we are called to follow the one who turned the world upside down and asks us to live in a way that contrasts with the world around us so that we can turn the world upside down too. Amen and amen. They stand. This is my oh, what a fool. We taste glory divine. Bear of salvation, the purchase of God. Born of its people, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praise my Savior, all the dear. This is my story, but this is my song. Praise my Savior, all the dear. this is my story. This is my song. Praise my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praise my Savior all the day long. I myself happy and blessed, watching and waiting to you, looking up. Watching love. This is my story. This is my
go from this place. Let your light so shine before those around you that they may see your good work, your life in the economy of the kingdom, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And go strengthened by the knowledge that in the goodness of God we were born, by the watchfulness of God we are kept all the day long, and in the love and mercy of God we are all being redeemed and made whole. Amen. Peace of God go with you.